great pleasure to be virtually at the KITV conference. Thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I apologize. I was uh, originally planning to be there. I didn't make it. Um, and so now I, I, and I don't have an excuse like the Europeans, <laughs> I should have been able to make it. Um, but uh, say love you, hopefully next time. Um, so uh, it's been an eclectic session, I guess every um, uh, very in, in interesting talks, but about different topics. And so keeping with that theme, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about something uh, totally different uh, about quantized energy pumps for out of equilibrium. Um, this is work with uh, David Long, uh, who is a PhD student here at you and has been leading the charge in a lot of these um, projects uh, for which related references are below. Uh, Phil Crowley, who was my uh, postdoc and is now a postdoc at uh, MIT with Leanne Fu, and Alicia Kohler, whom I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, who is a uh, superconducting qubits experimentalist at Maryland. Um, so I'll prim pr primarily be talking about the red reference today, but it builds off a number of the references and work with um, other people as, as on the slide. Okay. Um, Click. All right, so um, since the uh, realization in the late 40s that uh, you can uh, enhance the interactions between atoms and uh, light uh, by um, confining the light in a cavity, I think uh, we've come a long way in the field of uh, cavity QED. Um, so this is, for example, it's, it's our artist rendition, but um, an uh, example for experiments in ETH Zurich where I uh, uh, in a cavity, they have an ultra cold atomic gas and, and are uh, probing various effects of strong um, light matter coupling. Um, but, um, you know, there's nothing sacred about the atoms uh, or the cavity in the cavity QED. Um, so, in particular, these two uh, examples that just came up uh, replace optical light with microwave cavities um, and, in, and replace the uh, atoms with artificial atoms. So, in the uh, superconducting circuit QED architecture, there is a uh, Josephson junction based circuit element uh, of which two levels are used as a an effective atom a two level system uh, here I think this one is this is from a theory proposal I'm not sure what the experimental status is although um, perhaps um, members in the audience I think York Schmiedmeier was on um, this proposal so they can probably uh, update um, us uh, but these are proposals that use ensembles of uh, uh, nitrogen vacancy centers and diamond uh, coupled to microwave cavities in order to, among other things, these, uh, this also realizes uh, cavity QED physics. Uh, and finally, um, forget electromagnetic radiation altogether, uh, trapped ions can probe cavity QED physics by uh, coupling to the motional degree of freedom, uh, i.e. sound modes. Um, so uh, with, there's a large number of these architectures. They're all very sophisticated now, and in addition to having a cavity and some kind of uh, two-level system or an ensemble of them, um, there is a sophisticated toolbox for control of these systems um, that, you know, gives it additional driving that's possible. So it just raises the question, uh, what kinds of dynamical phases part of, part of equilibrium can we expect in such strongly driven, strongly coupled light matter systems? Um, so this is something we've been um, thinking about in the last few years. I'm not going to be able to, uh, of course, in a 20 minute talk, and I shouldn't <laughs> tell you about uh, everything we've done, but I want to just highlight a few results before we end the meet me to the talk. Um, so, the first, uh, maybe it's a bit surprising, is that even a single two level system, so qubits driven by um, quasi periodically, can exhibit distinct dynamical phases. Okay, so um, first to get that out of the way, quasi periodic sounds fancy, um, but really uh, for the purposes of this talk, you should simply think of it as driving with. Uh, multiple incommensurate tones. So here is uh, a baby example for a Hamiltonian uh, on a spin where you are using three incommensurate frequencies, for example, to drive the spin. Um, so even Hamiltonians like this, not the specific one, but uh, other ones like these can exhibit distinct dynamical phases. So specifically, if you have an odd number of such tones, uh, the, uh, there, there are topologically distinct classes labeled by an integer C to do with the generalized winding number. Um, we've studied this in detail uh, in for the three-tone case. And uh, so what are the distinct topological classes? Well, and what they, they have to do with um, uh, an integer, quanti integer quantized um, circulating energy current between the drives. So this is going to be a recurring theme um, through this talk and, and as promised in the title, in these kind of uh, quasi-periodically driven circuit QED systems, the generic, um, quantized 
response has to do with energy current between the drives. Okay, so uh, that's going to be the theme. And here, here the uh, that current is quantized and is labeled by this integer z. Uh, there is related work by uh, Michael Odebitz, who I think is in the uh, audience as well on the on the same uh, three tone difference. Bit. Um, so moving on. Uh, one can, of course, study extended systems that are also driven by multiple tones. Here, perhaps the most interesting um, result is on the wire driven by two incommensurate tones. Um, these wires, uh, in the presence of interactions and localization, can function as quantized energy pumps uh, at any temperature. So that is to say, irrespective of what's going on in the bulk, um, there's physics at the edge that uh, guarantees that in this chain, no matter uh, what the energy density, there is a quantized uh, rate of transfer of photons from um, this, this uh, two mode here to the three mode there. Um, so there's a formula up there, a way to just say it in words is the, uh, the rate of transfer is C photons per period of uh, this omega two drive into the uh, omega three um, drive. Um, so this is a new type of localization predicted order. I think. Uh, We've heard a lot about, and I guess we will be hearing more about time crystals, possibly on Thursday uh, in this uh, KITP conference. Those are on interacting localized systems with periodic drives. Uh, this uh, is a generic uh, stable phase for localized systems with uh, two increments returns, so quasi-periodic drives. Uh, happy to talk about, well, I don't know how, where to be. <laughs> happy to uh, say more if anybody's interested. But what I'm going to talk about today is what um, we just posted in the archive yesterday uh, to do with um, what we call cavity state boosting. Uh, and this is an effect in a periodically driven uh, cavity QED system, um, whereby uh, this system is behaves, uh, can be in a regime which behaves as an energy pump so that from this classical red tone, uh, energy can go into the cavity. But it's not just energy going into the cavity in, in, in any which way. Uh, it actually... Um, in specific times, it looks like whatever the cavity state was is simply translated in clock space. Um, so um, here is a plot showing that um, this is a numerical simulation in this specific system model coming up. So what, uh, what is being plotted is um, the probability distribution uh, for being in different occupation numbers in the cavity. So we're starting at time zero with a Fox state uh, with 10 photons, uh, letting the system go. So two features to observe. One is you see that this distribution on average is climbing up. This is the promised energy pump. Energy is going into the cavity, coming in from the drive, mediated through strong coupling of the qubit. Uh, but furthermore, it's not as if it just kind of broadens in, um, uh, in this uh, number space. Uh, there are these blue arrowed points. There are these periodic rephasings where a, uh, fog, uh, the state comes back to a near fog state with just a larger M. Um, this is what... Uh, I want to describe to you why does this occur, what, uh, what's the physics behind it, how it could be realized in near-term experiments, and, and then I'll close. Um, I, I want to comment that uh, I know Sarang and Ben, hopefully, I, I can't see them, but I think they're in the audience, uh, and they, they, were, they um, had, uh, there were recent experiments in Ben Lev's group, which uh, exploited integrability or proximity to integrability to do some, a somewhat related energy pumping. So it would be interesting to discuss, but it's not going to be the language that uh, we're not going to rely on integrability in order to get this effect here. Okay, so with that, um, let me uh, get down to it. Uh, so uh, what what is our system specifically? Um, so it's a periodically driven James Cummings model. Um, here's Hamiltonian. Uh, just to orient you, uh, starting from the left, uh, the term is H bar omega and hat is, of course, the cavity energy. Uh, term in the center is the um, James Cummings interactions between our two-level system uh, here uh, denoted with the spin and the cavity. And this uh, term in the right is a classical periodical drive on our qubit, um, which we can write out. Um, so uh, the classical drive is at a frequency capital omega, which is incommensurate with the cavity frequency little omega. Um, okay, it's some kind of drive in the XZ plane. Uh, maybe one thing to note about this is that um, as compared to the James Cummings model, one thing that's slightly strange about this model is that there is no mean Z, plits, Z splitting of the qubit. Instead, it's periodically modulated about um, zero and as a function of time. Okay, so that's a bit, that's slightly unusual, but um, uh, this is still what we're calling the periodically driven James Cummings model. And so to, to start to understand what this thing does, um, let's go to kind of a simple regime, which is 
uh, over the past few years been well studied now, um, which is that we'll take our cavity and put it in a coherent state, and a coherent state with a pretty large value of um, uh, you know, mean photon number, um, so that we can ignore any effects of coupling to the qubit, in particular if energy is being pumped into the cavity, we're going to ignore the fact that that is going to change the coherent state. Okay? So that's, um, that's, that's a classical approximation on the uh, cavity. And then we're further going to be in a regime uh, which is adiabatic, that is to say that the um, uh, F spin is going to see uh, due to the, both the cavity and the classical drive, sees time varying fields, but these time variations are sufficiently slow uh, so that the spin just kind of follows along with the effective field that it sees. So you might say this seems like a pretty trivial regime, you know, okay, so spin sees some classical drives and which are slow and follows them along, so what? So already here, um, and this, this was first uh, pointed out uh, at least in recent times by um, Martin Raphael and, Hel and Bert Halperin, um, there are already two um, in pre interesting pre-thermal regimes to do, um, oh, I should play this movie before I start. Mm. Anyway, um, to do with um, whether or not the qubit uh, mediates energy currents between the two drives or not. So on the left is the zero average pumping regime. So if you look at the block sphere, right, you see um, it's showing you where the spin is. The spin is kind of buzzing around the negative Z direction. And if you look at the right, it sees that you see that there is no average uh, number, uh, photon number change in either of the drives. In contrast, um, the, the regime, which is the quantized average pumping, um, the spin ex kind of explored the entire block sphere. There is a way to formalize that through a winding number. Uh, and that's accompanied by the fact that the, uh, there is an, an average, there's an average quantized rate with which the um, uh, photon population goes down in drive two and increases in drive one, okay? Um, so that's already, that's that's in, that's interesting and already in this kind of semi-classical regime where the spin adiabatically follows along with the field. Um, but you can see, if you just looked at this plot, that this is, you know, this is for a single uh, trajectory of the of the spin. Um, and so if you, if you started off the drives in different, um, with initial uh, different dive, drive phrases, uh, you'd have a, you'd have a different such trajectory, would also pump at the same average rate, but all these wiggles that you see here, right, would be different. Um, so just to show you that, um, same experiment as in the last um, uh, slide in the movie, but now what we're doing is we're looking across an ensemble of trajectories um, where we start this, the spin falling along an effective field, but the effective field is different at, uh, at starting points, which you can uh, get this ensemble by varying the initial phases of the two drives. Um, and so the feature here is, like I promised, there's still an average pumping rate true for this entire ensemble. But now um, you can see that there are these rephasings appearing, as in our um, the Fox state plot I started off with, um, whereby this entire ensemble at these times, so for example, I think this one is at uh, uh, five periods of the classical drive, eight periods of the classical drive. What has happened is that irrespective of what was the starting uh, drive phase, the number of photons that has been pumped is, is the same. Um, so those are these periodic re uh, rephasings, and, I, and these blue errors are not random times. They are at predictable times, we can predict them, and they're called al at almost periods. So uh, what's an almost period and what's so special about it that we should see rephasing? Well, an almost period, like the name suggests, is where the, um, you know, we have, we have two drives. They are incommensurate, so they have no period, but at some times they can both almost come back to their starting values. And when that happens, um, the effective field in the spin, because the drive, drives come back uh, close to their, um, both of them come back to close to the starting values, the effective field in the spin comes back close to the starting value, and the spin state, which is simply following along the effective field uh, in the, at zeroth order in the adiabatic approximation, comes back to its t equal zero value. Um, so that's fine, but that's simply, you know, what's going on at this moment, at the almost period. To know how many photons have been pumped into the cavity, you kind of need to know the entire history of what happened until that almost period. Um, and so um, this is, and I'm not showing this to you, but uh, what you can show is that photon, if you looked at the uh, photons pumped into the cavity up to these almost periods, you can express it as an integral over the drive phases uh, up to a error that's going down with the uh, time the almost period itself. So um, this you can both show that this thing is an integer, and second that it's independent of the uh, starting drive phases. Okay, so uh, so that's what's special about the almost periods. 
uh, that they, at those points, you can, in the semi-classical regime, show that you get uh, the same number of photons pumped into the cavity to an error that's vanishing with the uh, almost period value itself. And now you might, uh, you might be tempted to say, what, why even almost periods? Seems like uh, this kind of physics just maybe has to do with uh, periods. Certainly, uh, if I had uh, two commensurate drives, maybe even the same frequency or one is double the other, uh, you know, at periods, the effective field and spin would come back to its uh, t is equal to zero values, and spin state would come back to t is equal to zero, zero value. So, you know, what, what's so special about quasi-periodic or incommensurate drives? Um, so this graph here um, uh, plots out the uh, variance of uh, the, uh, so if we went back here, uh, basically the kind of width of these, um, a width of n across this ensemble of trajectories for both um, uh, commensurate in red and incommensurate uh, drive frequencies. Uh, and you see something quite uh, startling. Um, you see that when you have incommensurate drives, the uh, quality of these rephasings gets better and better as you wait for longer and longer, almost periods as, I prom as we saw in the previous slide. But if you had commensurate um, frequencies, so here ratio three halves, then it's getting worse, right? Um, and this, this has to do with the fact that with commensurate frequencies, the different, um, the trajectories at different initial drive phases, they, they, uh, they, all of them pump energy into the cavity, but at slightly different rates. And so that, that slightly different rate, rates means that it just gets worse in time, how, how well they can um, reface. So, so to see this effect, one needs to look at almost, almost periods with, with quasi-periodic drives. That is an important uh, feature of uh, seeing these rephasings robustly at uh, late times. Okay, so that's the heart of, uh, of this cavity state boosting, but there's a little bit more work to be done, right? Because I argued that in kind of a classical limit where it wasn't even important that we had a cavity because I put it in a, in a coherent state, which is just functioning as a classical drive. Um, but so now um, going back to the fact that we have a cavity QED system, uh, what we do is we think about the state of the uh, entire system in, in the semi-classical basis. So uh, if you look here, I've kind of highlighted two of these states to tell you uh, what this is superposition of. We're thinking of the cavity plus uh, spin state in terms of superposition of coherent states on the cavity and uh, states on the spin that are either aligned or anti-aligned with the effective field uh, that, it sees, uh, that the spin sees, right? So the same kinds of states that we were just uh, using to construct an ensemble, except now they're gonna be in a superposition. And so at these almost periods, much as we just argued in the last few slides, you could say that the change in the cavity population would be the same for all these uh, states in the superposition. But now you have to do a little bit more work um, to argue that the phase that they accrue is also the same, right? So because if you have a coherent superposition, um, they, the phase information is retained. That's the difference between that and a classical ensemble. So you can argue that as well. And so that, that this kind of tells you that for any um, non-classical, uh, initial state of the cavity and qubit um, under some conditions that specifically that the non-classical state for the cavity has to be narrow in occupation number uh, space, um, you would expect this kind of boosting effect. Okay, so um, just to visualize it one more time, um, these are again, uh, this on the top panel here shows you the distribution of the cavity state in the occupation number basis, again, for a starting Fox state. Um, so we're starting with a Fox state with 10 photons in the cavity and the spin in, in pointing along um, a specific direction here, here X for the um, kinds of drives that we chose. We let the system go with this periodically driven cavity QD system, intermediate periods, it's a bit uh, spread out. And then almost period, it comes back to a, uh, a near Fox state around I guess 22. Um, but uh, visualizing this in phase space, um, this, is, this is the uh, Kusimi Q function uh, for the quantum optics experts among you. Uh, but what it is is basically visualization of the amplitude of the density matrix of the cavity in coherent space, space right? So I roughly read a plot like this saying that uh, the density matrix of the cavity has weight on all these coherent states, this red circle. Um, and, and uh, you know, and our semi-classical description uh, kind of tells you about each one of these coherent states. So at intermediate times, these coherence packets are moving in or out um, 
uh, they are not perfectly even on a circle, uh, but then you wait to this almost period and they've all kind of gotten to this blue circle. Each one of these local human factors have gone there and they occur at the same phase. And so we, we uh, get a new clock state. Um, okay, uh, so uh, that's all very nice. Um, you know, can we see this? Uh, so the, uh, that, let me back up again to the, uh, the Hamiltonian, the one Hamiltonian to rule them all, periodically driven James Cummings model, and ask ourselves in which regime is this effect robust? Um, and, you know, there were, there were some words in there that we can now convert into uh, actual um, comparison of energy scales, which is that we want the uh, spin to be, you know, we want this to be in an adiabatic regime. And adiabatic already tells you that whatever is varying in time, which is to do with the frequencies of the classical drive and the cavity, better be the small scales. And in fact, they have to be the small scales as compared to the interaction scale between the qubit and the cavity, as well as the amplitude of variation, right? So, which is, this is all in the literature, I think this would be called ultra strong coupling. If you walk up to an experimentalist and say ultra strong coupling, they make faces like these. Um, you know, I mean, they may try to smile a little bit. I think there are certain systems where ultra strong uh, coupling has been demonstrated, but it's hard to come by, certainly hard to come by without um, while maintaining a James Cummings type interactions, you tend, once you start going to strong couplings, you, uh, you know, you may have processes that uh, both excite the oscillator and the qubit, the A dagger S plus, those kinds of terms. So anyway, that, this seems bad news bears for um, um, uh, observing this effect. Um, but um, thankfully for us, uh, there are rotated worlds, rotating frames, in which uh, we might be able to engineer the same physics, uh, and then, and thus happen also see it in the lab frame. So um, I have up here a lab Hamiltonian that is uh, much more conventional in a um, cavity QED setting. So this is a uh, cavity coupled to a, a qubit with a um, modulated uh, Z splitting, uh, Robbie interaction between them and, and another um, kind of classical drive on the qubit. Um, now in a, in, in, an organization of the energy scales, which is what you'd say strong coupling is. So this is still uh, this is still not um, uh, in cav not easy necessarily in cavity QED, but I think is now pretty routine in circuit QED, superconducting qubit architectures. Um, in a rotating frame, uh, this realizes the Hamiltonian that we want, periodically driven James Cummings Hamiltonian at ultra strong coupling. So that's really good news because it says that we can realize this Hamiltonian in a rotating frame. And furthermore, the boosting effect in the rotating frame is identical to that in the lab frame. So this is the way we would go about engineering this uh, in order to create, do this boosting. Um, so with that, I think my time's done. So let me conclude. Um, I talked about a periodically driven cavity QED system. Um, first showing you that it was a, a quantized energy pump, uh, but it was more than that because the, that quantization is only on average. What I showed you is that there were specific times, on, which were almost periods, which you can analytically predict, uh, at which uh, it's it's not just pumping energy in, but it's really kind of translating non-classical states of the cavity to like higher occupation numbers. So we call boosting. This is a topological effect. I didn't um, emphasize that, but it, it's it's something that um, doesn't you know should be stable to at least some kinds of perturbations. For example, those that uh, modify the instantaneous Hamiltonian, but um, keep you in this regime. Um, and uh, if it's realized, I think it could be exciting because maybe this, this is, it's reasonably simple protocols to boost any kind of state. It's not even, it's not, you know, I, I showed you primarily false states as an example, but the same protocol would, you would, could use to uh, start to boost uh, cat states. So these are uh, states that are um, uh, come up in the context of bosonic and coded qubits. There are cat states of two coherent states, but same thing. Protocol doesn't change at all. Just prepare, start your cavity and uh, in a in a in such a cat state with low occupation number, run this for some time, and then you would boost it to um, cat states centered or on higher uh, values of uh, alpha. Um, and yeah, we were hopeful that this is achievable near-term superconducting optical cavity QED systems, which I'm um, be exciting. Go outward from there. Uh, with that. Uh, thank you to my collaborators again. People will fund me and for you, uh, for your attention. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia.
so um, I think that Jamir was the first one to raise the hand, please. Yes. Hi, Inusha. Thank you so much for the talk. So my question will sound a little bit aggressive, but it is not, okay? Just probably because it's very late at my place. <laughs> I, lost, I, lost the, I lost the basic mechanism. So we have a Jane Cummings. We don't have any symmetry because this field is along several directions. So this is also true when you restore counter-rotating terms, like in this Dicke thing. And you mentioned something about topology at the beginning, which I couldn't connect. So uh, please, I know that is the typical start of people that want to downgrade your talk. I don't want to do so, but I, I know these models and I not seeing immediately how you get a quantized response by, by a drive in such simple systems. But it's certainly, I mean, the, the, the bad time in Europe. Okay. I mean, I can, I, um, it was also 20 minutes and there were lots of pieces in there. So um, no offense, offense taken, but I can say what this is. So, um, uh, so this is the model. Um, maybe I'll go up to where you can also see the um, classical drive, right? So uh, we have, um, so it's a, it's a James Cummings type model with a special drive, a classical drive on the qubit. Um, and we're in a regime that's not usual for James Cummings type thing, which is that we want the frequency of the cavity and the drive to be the smallest scales in the problem. Um, mm -hmm. And we want the qubits, like the, the kind of interactions with the qubit as well as the driving amplitudes to be very large, right? So this, this is why I said it's kind of ultra strong coupling or whatever. It's not, um, usually you're thinking in regimes where the qubit and cavity are nearly resonant and the G is, is a smaller scale, right? Um, and this is not there. So this is kind of why it wouldn't have been, it's not a natural place that you work with uh, in the lab frame. Mm -hmm. uh, I was arguing you can realize this in a rotating frame because in a rotating frame, basically the relevant omega here becomes the detuning. And so you can bring that down as compared to the Gs that you have. Roughly that's why, right? So the relevant frequency in a rotating frame can be much slower because you've rotated out the fast frequency to do with it. In the cavity. Okay, so this is, but this is the model. And, uh, and then now in response to your question, topology, pumping, when does it happen? So when it happens is that the, um, it can happen when uh, the, um, it's easier to see if you put the cavity in a coherent state, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you put a cavity in a coherent state, you see that we just have an effective spin Hamiltonian, because you know, I, I forget the cavity energy. I just have an effective spin Hamiltonian. And the spin Hamiltonian, if it causes uh, the spin, uh, the spin is, is, is in an adiabatic regime. And if it follows an effective field that winds along the block sphere, mm -hmm. then it's in this quantized regime. The, uh, so I didn't connect it to topology. I didn't tell you the connections to topology. No, no, but, 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 but I do follow. So the photon is in a coherent state. Of course, the dynamics of spin and photon are coupled. And then how quantization comes when you separate the energy scales in this unusual way? That's the, the, um, the missing So it, 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 it has to do with a, um, the churn number of the, uh, um, or uh, the, you know, the integrated Berry curvature of the spin state. So, so basically there's a map. Once you say it's an, it's an adiabatic uh, manifold, right? And the spin adiabatically follows an effective field. Then you get a map uh, from the, um, to the block, uh, uh, from um, the, 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 the wave functions give you a, a map from the torus, uh, because uh, to specify the um, uh, field view, I have to tell you the two drive, the drive phases of drive one and drive two. Basically, there's two angles here to do with the, this angle theta one. And if I put this thing in a coherent state, that angle of that theta two. So there's a map from the torus to the sphere. It has a wind, non-zero winding number. And that's, okay, it's abstract, but that's the topology hiding there. And I have to do a little bit more work to relate that to this actual physical observable, which is uh, uh, energy pumped into the, uh, into the cavity. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We let Mike continue. Yes, Michael, please. Hi, right, thank you. Um, so I wanna make sure I understand something that I guess we talked about before, maybe I didn't understand it. So, um, if I really treat these as photons, meaning that A becomes larger the more photons I have, the matrix yeah. elements become larger, obviously this eventually gets cut off at large photon number because you push yourself out of the topological regime. Yes. So first, I want to make sure I understand. If I don't do that, if I just treat A as what I would call a Q-dit, so just A goes to N minus 1, but without any matrix element, 
the effect would continue forever and the rephasings would continue forever, correct? Uh, if, yeah, indeed, yes, that's right. So if you don't put the feedback effect into the fact that you're actually pumping photons into the cavity, which causes A to go up in time, uh, it would, it could, it can, oh, well, okay, sorry. It can, even then it doesn't continue forever because this is only a pre-thermal effect, even in the ideal semi-classical. Okay. Fair enough. Um, um, so, yeah, but it can go for a long time, way longer than the times I was showing you in any of the explanations. Okay, good. So then my second question is, is for actual photons, um, is there some clean way of understanding what's the time scale before you push yourself out of the topological regime, some scaling argument? Um, yes. So this was in, uh, um, I think, Frederick Nathan and Ivar Gill have uh, first studied this. Uh, uh, so yes, it's basically that it's kind of the dumb criterion, replace A hat by square root N um, e to the i theta, and then treat that root N as just did you you can um, uh, figure out the maximum n by treating that like the semi classical model. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. No, that makes sense. And have you? And that run... works. You know that that worked. That gave you the kind of maximum photon number up to which you can pump. And until then, they also demonstrated that the rate was quantized on average, and it was it was pumping well. And then it kind of like reflects off that boundary, and then then easier things happen. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, if not, we thank Anusha again. <laughs>